Well, uh, Mr. Bo, thank you very much for, for a very interesting presentation and very detailed and full of, of information, in fact, of what you have studied and found out. Uh, I'm just, on, on what you said, I have sort of two points of argument and then I will give, give you my own view. Uh, you said that the so-called right to protect would give some sort of... Uh, you said that uh, the, the formula right to protect, which was uh, uh, discussed 20 years ago by, and so on, that that would give legitimacy to a country like Russia uh, to go in and protect uh, ethnic Russians in another country. That's not true, I would say. Uh, it has been uh, disavowed by the Security Council, UN Security Council and by the UN General Assembly. That, it doesn't give a right to one country to go in and uh, fight another country. And again, and you said, you indicated that, the, uh, the sort of idea of Mr. Putin to recognize the two uh, so-called republics of Donetsk and Lugansk and then say this is Russian territory and this gives us a right. Uh, this is also, well, it's not correct under international law. What the Russians have said, which is true, you didn't mention it, but you could have mentioned it, is of course the example of Kosovo, how the West behaved vis-à-vis -vis Kosovo when they detached Kosovo from Serbia using similar arguments, but that was also uh, a breach of international law. Now, let me give you uh, my own thoughts on this uh, crisis in Ukraine. I'll try to be very short. I think the main and first uh, point to say that this, uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a crime. It's a war crime. It's a crime of aggression under the United Nations Charter. There can be no excuses for this. You can't just attack another country because you don't like uh, its policies. Or, well, you can say that presidents, the American and the British invasion of Iraq in 2003, that was also a crime under international law. And there are several other cases, but one, one crime does not excuse another crime. And again, the behavior of, of the Russian uh, uh, military forces uh, in uh, in Ukraine are also, we've seen war crimes during this fight too, I mean, that's a fact. Now, uh, so there are no excuses, you can't excuse uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you can't. But on the other hand, there are factors that explain why we are in this situation, and you've touched on these uh, factors. And I want also to discuss this, and I would say there are two main dimensions, as you, you also mentioned that. One is the dimension between or the, the, the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. That's one dimension. And the other main dimension, which I think is even more important, that's about it between Russia and the uh, United <coughs> States and West. Now, if you take the first dimension, Russia, Ukraine, you will find that for the last 30 years, since Ukraine de declared independence in 91, for 30 years, uh, the Russian government, the Ukrainian government have quarreled uh, all the time about different things, about the status of the ethnic Russians in Ukraine, about the Sevastopol naval base, about the gas deliveries, about the, 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 the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, and so on and so forth, about Crimea. I'll come back to the details. But I mean, for 30 years, and there are at least 12, 15 different quarrels that's been gone, going on between these two countries, and also touching the identity of Ukraine, of course, and the history of Ukraine. Now, on the other dimension, the dimension between between Russia and the United States, this has a uh, even, you know, I would say it has a history of 75 years. It's a confrontation that has been uh, on and off since the end of the, of the Second World War, since uh, 1945, and certainly since uh, NATO was founded in, in uh, 1948. <coughs> and on the Russian side, there is a, a dominant opinion that you, United States and the NATO, they have ignored Russia's legitimate security interest with respect to its borders, with respect to its interests uh, uh, interest in, in Europe, and all the time NATO have, with its bases, its force structures have come closer and closer to the Russian border, and the Russians have said, well, uh, we don't like this, we, will, we, we would like to have other sorts of agreements and understand with the West, but they have been, been ignored. And you also have the Russian, the, the NATO's military uh, missile installations in Romania and, and in, in Poland, 
uh, and uh, the fact that the uh, uh, United States have dropped out of all the arms control agreements with Russia. There are a lot of concerns on the Russian side, and not just with Mr. Putin, but with a lot of people about the way the West has treated uh, Russia uh, for the last uh, 20 years, I would say. Now, neither these bilateral quarrels between the Russian and Ukrainian government, nor this sort of ideological confrontation with the, with the uh, West, is a, as I said, it's not an excuse for this terrible war. Uh, just now, the most important thing is to get a ceasefire in, in the war. I mean, every day hundreds of people are dying. Uh, People are saying 100,000 people have died. Well, you may have been uh, right, <coughs> tens of thousands, I would say, but tens of thousands of people have died, hundreds of people are dying, and a lot of infrastructure and uh, so on is destroyed in, in Ukraine. Uh, the, the war uh, is a catastrophe for, for, for Ukraine, and it's also a tragedy for Russia. It's all in many bad. So uh, one must strive to find a ceasefire. And I am, as you, very disappointed and that uh, the, uh, the feelers that were made between Russia and Ukraine and the efforts of Turkey and so on in, in uh, March uh, last year, they came to nothing. Probably, as you said, because of the intervention of the Brits and the Americans. They, they, they said to the Ukraine, no, 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 don't go for a peace agreement. We will help you to, to defeat the Russians. So there's a very grave responsibility on the West. You're absolutely right in that. Now, I mean, if you should say that we must have a strive for a ceasefire, how can a ceasefire be, be obtained in, in, uh, in this war? I think an absolutely precondition uh, and a great responsibility is on the Americans. The Americans must resume a dialogue with the Russians. They must discuss with the Russians their concerns about their security, these arms control agreements, and so on. They must do this again. And they must talk to the Ukrainians, to, to Zelensky and company, and say, well, this war cannot go on, we can't continue supplying arms, we must get an end to it. So there is a, a big responsibility on the Americans. Now, uh, if you get you know, a ceasefire, then you will aim to some sort of or, or, or a peace agreement. It's fairly clear what such an <coughs> overall agreement should um, consist of. First of all, a military ceasefire, that's number one. Secondly, a Russian withdrawal of their troops, main part of their troops, to the situation before 24th of February uh, 2022. And this means, of course, that uh, Crimea in practice and, uh, uh, will remain Russian, yes, and possibly, and also main part of Donbass. The, 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 the difficult issue territorially is the link between Donbass and, and Crimea. And, uh, of course, uh, Ukraine will not accept that that will be part of Russia. The Russia will insist uh, they need a link there, the Russian leaving, uh, living there. So I suppose the final result on the mediation sometimes in the future will be some sort of international zone, a gray zone, or UN observers, I don't know, link in this corridor between Donbass and and, and the Crimea. <laughs> then, uh, uh, talking about the security policy, uh, Ukraine will have to go back to the policy pursued before uh, 2000, formed, uh, before 2019, in fact, before 2014. That is, that uh, uh, Ukraine will not be part, will not be member of the NATO military alliance. It will renounce from that. And that was in the previous. Uh, Ukrainian constitution, and Zelensky said so uh, also. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Ukraine will demand and will get uh, strong security uh, guarantees from the West, from the United States, from uh, bilateral uh, gu uh, security guarantees from the United States, from uh, Britain and other countries, uh, Turkey, perhaps even Russia. Guarantees, not assurances. They had assurances under the Budapest Memorandum in uh, 2004, uh, uh, no, 8, or? Uh, 1994. No. The Budapest Memorandum. Budapest was in... 94. 94. 94. 94. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. There were assurances, but they were not good enough. They need guarantees. 
And then another thing that will be necessary to achieve a peace solution will be you know, strong links between uh, Ukraine and the uh, European Union. They have been uh, promised membership. It's very difficult to envision how they can become member of the European Union, but anyhow, they have to have very strong links, and they already have uh, visa-free agreements and free trade, and uh, all that has to be strengthened. And then another part of our, our settlement will have to be dismantling of the, the um, uh, sanctions against Russia, and that will be part of, of the package. And of course, another final uh, uh, piece will be a uh, fund for international reconstruction of Ukraine. I mean, all these uh, sort of steps that everyone understands it, uh, that's, uh, that will be the final solution. Well, will we, will we come to that? I don't know. And no one knows this. Uh, there is at present a certain stalemate in the, in the, uh, in the fighting. But both sides are saying they are preparing an offensive. The Ukrainians are saying that, the Russians are saying that. Uh, so uh, I would say there is a great urge, really, on, on the Western powers uh, to, to, you know, to consider the situation and uh, see to it that it doesn't get worse. Uh, was it possible to prevent this war? Well, I think it was. If the West had behaved in a different way, if they had taken the Russian concerns more seriously, I think even as late as December uh, 2021, when the Russian government formulated its, its demands uh, on the West, if they had been taken more seriously by, by the West, not this question about membership of NATO, but the other issues about uh, arms control, uh, ex military exercises, uh, missile deployment, and so on, uh, but nothing came of that, and, and then uh, the war started. Uh, another precondition for, for, for a solution, or for, for movements to, to a solution, would be that there would be less of press conference diplomacy and public diplomacy. Now everyone, you know, Biden, Blinken, Zelensky, Putin, everyone are saying these are demands and so on. You don't achieve peace by that. You'll have to do it uh, uh, through uh, through uh, dialogue, silent uh, diplomacy, back-channel contact. That was the way the equally serious Cuba crisis in 1962 was solved, not by these sort of uh, public statements that sort of uh, makes the situation even worse. Uh, in, at least in Sweden, uh, there is a great deal of debate and in many other European countries. Well. Uh, Russia is, is aggressive, Russia is an imperial state, that they attack uh, the Baltic states or the Scandinavian That is just rubbish, of course, complete rubbish. Russia will not go to war with a country that uh, is a member of the European Union or NATO. There is no need for Russia. The consequences will be catas uh, catastrophic. Now, the, the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, I would say, uh, in a sense, is it's a, it, it's a sequence of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I served in, 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 um, in the Moscow between 1994 uh, and 2004, and I've, well, I've been dealing with security policy all my life. And if you uh, think back at uh, in the beginning of the 90s and the war in Yugoslavia, when, uh, when then the war when Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia was dissolved, so to speak. War started immediately among the republics. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, everyone said, oh, well, then no wars. But I mean, the contradictions were there. And the wars we didn't see, or the conflicts we didn't see in 91, we see them now. We saw it in Georgia 2008, we saw it in Maidan 2014, we saw it in, we see it now in uh, 22. And they have deep roads. But uh, let me go back uh, a bit to, to the um, uh, issues between Russia and Ukraine. There is this uh, different views on the identity of Ukraine. Is U Ukraine or was Ukraine a different, uh, uh, a different historically different realm, so to speak, uh, or uh, was it uh, was uh, was it for? Hundreds, two hundred, certain three hundred years, just a part of Tsarist Russia, or the regions east of the Dnieper rivers, and there uh, during these uh, Tsarist periods, these there were Russian gubernia. This was the Kharkovskia, Paltovskia, 
Khersonske, Azovske gubernia, but just the ordinary parts of the Tsarist Russia, and this lasted for a very long time, 200, 300 years. Uh, and this sort of identity issue is, of course, very crucial. And you know the history that Western Ukraine, what we not now call Western Western Ukraine, was for first hundred, couple of hundred years was a part of Poland, Lithuania, and after that it was part of the Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire. So there are, uh, it's it, it's a region that has been uh, with shifting borders and shifting uh, uh, masters. <coughs> Now, uh, another, uh, of course, uh, equally uh, difficult issue between the two countries uh, is Crimea, and particularly the naval bases of Sevastopol. Crimea became uh, Russian in 1774, something like that, when they defeated uh, the, the Ottoman, uh, uh, Ottomans and took that uh, 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 piece of land, and then it was very important. The Crimean War in, in the 53 became a here state, and then the Second World War. And Sevastopol and the naval base is absolutely crucial for the Russian Navy for uh, its operations in the Black Sea and in the in the um, Mediterranean. And I remember back in 2002, 2004, the Russians were saying to me that if the Ukrainians tried to evict us from Sevastopol, that would be a causes belly. That would be a question of, of war and peace. So that was uh, it's a main issue. And then for 30 years they were quarreling about this uh, gas deliveries and the pipelines with gas going through Ukraine uh, to Europe, and where the Russians paid for transit, and the Ukrainians also bought gas for their own, <coughs> own, own, uh, own uh, use. But they could never really uh, agree on the prices and uh, big Ukrainian debts to, to, to Russia that were not paid and so on. So that was the thorny point. And you got the ethnic issue, about 18%, uh, uh, I mean, in, before the war, about 18% of the population of Ukraine, which was then 46 million, they were ethnic Russians. And about 30% were had uh, Russian as a mother, mother tongue. And about 80, 90% spoke Russian, I mean, even those who had uh, Ukrainian as their first language. Uh, and then, of course, everything that happened in, in 2004, when, when uh, you had the uh, when when you had uh, uh, when Yanukovych lost uh, at the presidential election and the Maidan uh, problems in 2004, and generally uh, the the orientation of the of Kiev was it was it leaning towards Moscow? Was it leaning towards Brussels? And the European Union didn't handle this well, very well in, in 2014. The Commission said then during this agreement, uh, talks about uh, uh, trade agreements and the system, they told, uh, they told uh, Yanukovych, you have to choose. You have to choose between Brussels and Moscow. And that's impossible. Ukraine cannot choose. But it has to be part. It has to, be, to deal both with the West and the East. It was absolutely the wrong attitude. And uh, Mr. Borg mentioned uh, the problems uh, with the uh, Ukrainian government's discrimination of the Russian language, and culture, and television stations. They're very important. It's very important for, for ordinary people. And now you have the church issue. The latest is uh, that uh, the fight between the different Orthodox churches in Ukraine, uh, and the most precious thing there is the Lavra Monastery in Kiev, uh, which is uh, one of the most precious. <laughs> Uh, Orthodox churches in the whole Slav uh, world, <coughs> and uh, where the Kiev government now tries to take it over from the Russian patriarchate, and that's very you know, explosive issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the Azovska uh, Sea of uh, Azov and, and the, the uh, navigation there, also a very thorny issue. And again, uh, the Russian fear that. Uh, in the end, uh, or that the main aim on the western side is to build up Ukraine as a base area for uh, possible military operations against Russia, even if it's not a member of NATO. So there are a lot of concerns there. Uh, Monsieur Moore uh, mentioned the sanctions. I agree completely with him. I've been against sanctions for, for you know, the last 50 years. Sanctions are very easy to decide. Uh, practically never lead to, to 
what's his aim, the change of policy on the other side, no. Uh, it affects negatively uh, the, the population, but not the leadership. Uh, and uh, they create hardship and all this, but they don't change policy. They don't change policy in Iran, they don't ch change policy uh, in Russia and, they don't, uh, and other places. Uh, and they will not lead to a regime change in Russia. The Russian uh, population has, uh, in a sense, suffered enough during all the, you know, uh, hundreds of years. They've been worse. They've been through worse times than these sanctions. They've been through Stalin, wars, uh, famine, and all this. Uh, this is just a little more. So it, 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 the war is not popular, but it will not lead to regime change in in, uh, in uh, Russia. Uh, so, and I must say, I regret very much that the European uh, EU Commission has become so militarized as it has become in recent years, and concentrating on arms production, arms deliveries. That, that's not really the concept of the European Union that I have, who has been a strong uh, supporter of the uh, EU since uh, the early 60s, or you know, the predecessors of the EU. What worries me in particular now uh, is uh, another issue. During the Cold War, we talked about a sort of ideological conflict between two worlds. You have the West Europe and the United States and so on, uh, market economy, democracy, on the other side, you had communism and the Gosplan and all that. Two completely different value systems. Then one said, when the Soviet Union collapsed, oh, fine, now we don't have any ideological conflicts. We may have different uh, interests and all that, but we don't have this sharp ideological conflict and warfare that we had and that led to, to uh, you know, uh, different um, fights, uh, undercover, so to speak, in the third world. But what we've seen in the last five years, we've seen the emergence of a new ideological conflict. <coughs> when the United States and also the West European sta uh, states start to talk about a rules-based international order. They don't talk about the UN Charter or international law. They talk about the rules-based international order, which is you know, these are principles that the United States and EU have established themselves. Right, uh, right to protect and various other things that, that serve their interest. We can do what we think is right with respect to human rights and democracy and, uh, you know, uh, and strive to intervene in, in Syria because Assad is, is, a, is a dictator and so on. That's a, uh, a rules-based international uh, system. While on the other side, you have Russia, China, Iran, uh, Turkey, possibly uh, uh, Hungary and other countries, which are more, how I say, traditional, they insist formally on the UN Charter, formally on international law, uh, and uh, uh, they are then called autocratic and so on. And, and so you have this dimension of two different value systems, uh, and you have that in family traditions and, and so on, human rights, a different view. And that's very uh, dangerous because it's mo much more difficult to compromise on values. On interest you can compromise, but uh, if you have completely different value systems, it's very, uh, it's, uh, uh, very dangerous. Now, if there is not a, a solution to this conflict in Ukraine, and, well, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to think it will be as long as Putin is in power. I, I don't think there will be a sort of coup against him. I think he will stay in power at least until next spring when there are presidential elections in, uh, in, uh, in Russia and he has a formal right uh, to be a candidate. He will then be <laughs> 72 years. And then he has been in power for uh, uh, 24 years. And that should be enough. And I and some others hope, believe that he will not stand uh, again for a candidate, uh, as a candidate for president. And I think many Russians would not want him to do so. And then we will get another sort of uh, government. I don't think we'll get a Putin two after a Putin one. We'll get more sort of collective uh, 
system of government, uh, senior bureaucrats, uh, that remains to be seen. But that's crucial in the next year's presidential war. The long-term consequences, if there is no settlement, are of course very dangerous because now there is a trend on the West, in the West. It's very much uh, uh, how shall I say, encouraged by some of the East European members of the European Union to boycott everything Russian, everything. Not just I mean that the war is wrong and, uh, and we should get more uh, arms to Ukraine, but we should boycott all Russian, or, uh, Russian sportsmen, cultural. Uh, we shouldn't read the Russian books and all this and that. <laughs> that is much worse uh, an attitude uh, than we had during the Cultural War, uh, during the Cold War. Then we, we traveled and we flew to Russia, and they come here, we had sports events and all this and that. And uh, we disliked and uh, we condemned the communism and uh, Russian occupation of Eastern Europe, but we could still <laughs> deal with them. And now there is an effort to cut off everything Russian and build, I mean, make Russia a sort of isolated. Uh, a large uh, country like North Korea in the midst of Europe. It won't work because Russia has uh, support from China and the Global South. Uh, but we risk, uh, we risk getting a very <coughs> embittered Russian government and population and it's worth thinking back on the uh, treatment of Germany and the Versailles Peace Treaty and what consequences that had. Uh, there are some people who hope that China will be able to change the behavior of, of uh, the Russian government of Putin. That will not happen. That will not happen. Uh, as I said, I think what approved uh, last week during Mr. Xi Jinping's visit to, to China, uh, to, to, to Moscow, the two uh, countries have very close relations, they need each other, uh, and uh, no, uh, that will not happen. So, what may happen? Either it will get worse, or there will be a stalemate, some sort of peace treaty. The Russians will will keep uh, parts of Donbass, they'll keep, uh, they'll keep um, uh, Crimea, and Putin will say, "Well, I uh, uh, protected Russian interests in, in the, uh, along our frontiers. So the Ukraine will not be a member of NATO, so I've done my thing. He will present that to, to his own population, uh, and that's very important for him. For you know, uh, uh, a leader like Putin, he's very he's very concerned about you know what will be his reputation. So he, he will have to formulate for himself a sort of a reputation that is. The information channels in Russia will accept. It will not be accepted outside the Russia. But he has to have some uh, have some sort of who made victory for it. Well, and well, there are some of my thoughts uh, on the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much.